Chapter 6 Ludwig Wittgenstein to Russia with Love Never stay up on the barren heights of cleverness, but come down into the green valleys of silliness. Ludwig Wittgenstein Ludwig Wittgenstein is widely regarded as the 20th century genius par excellence. What about his politics? As with many aspects of his philosophy, his political views are also hard to pin down. Almost the only evidence we have consists of casual remarks he made to his friends, which have been passed down to us with varying degrees of reliability. Nevertheless, I will try to show that it is reasonable to infer that Wittgenstein had strong sympathies for the Soviet political regime of the 30s. Several pieces of evidence, which individually may be difficult to interpret with certainty, converge to support this conclusion. But there is also one specific, verifiable fact to be introduced last, which has a lot of probative force on its own and which strengthens the argument considerably. Language Games at the Soviet Embassy Wittgenstein was born in Vienna in 1889. After the publication of his Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus in 1921, he achieved something of a cult status in philosophy and beyond. When Wittgenstein returned to Cambridge in 1929, John Maynard Keynes wrote to his wife, Well, God has arrived. I met him on the 515 train. Soon Wittgenstein became a philosophy lecturer at Cambridge University. An important event for our purposes is his visit to the Soviet Union in 1935. At that time, he was even seriously considering the possibility of moving there permanently. Ray Monk, in his excellent biography of Wittgenstein, sets the stage for us. The summer of 1935 was the time when Marxism became, for the undergraduates at Cambridge, the most important intellectual force in the university, and when many students and dons visited the Soviet Union in the spirit of pilgrimage. Despite the fact that Wittgenstein was never at any time a Marxist, he was perceived as a sympathetic figure by the students who formed the core of the Cambridge Communist Party, many of whom attended his lectures. Monk suggests that Wittgenstein's reasons for wanting to visit Russia were very different from those of his communist acquaintances at Cambridge. I am not so sure, for reasons I will explain in a moment. Wittgenstein's initial efforts to get a Soviet visa were unsuccessful. So on July 6, 1935, he wrote a letter to his friend Keynes to ask for help. It might be useful for me to get an introduction from you to Ivan Maisky, the Soviet ambassador in the United Kingdom. You would have to say in your introduction that I am your personal friend and that you are sure that I am in no way politically dangerous. That is, if this is your opinion. Keynes wrote a letter of introduction to Maisky on July 10th and sent a copy to Wittgenstein. The key part. Wittgenstein is not a member of the Communist Party, but has strong sympathies with the way of life which he believes the new regime in Russia stands for. Since it is well known how sensitive Wittgenstein was about personal honesty and how much he hated duplicity and dissembling, the fact that he accepted Keynes's statement without a murmur tells us he probably thought it was a good description of himself. Notice that the statement does not say anything about Wittgenstein's love of, say, Tolstoy, Russian culture, the Slavic soul, or anything like that. No, it cites his strong sympathies for the way of life he believes the new regime in Russia stands for. This is hard to interpret in any other way than meaning Wittgenstein had strong sympathies for Russian communism. And if Wittgenstein did not mind Keynes's describing him this way to the Soviet ambassador, then perhaps neither should we. As I said, it is possible this was a false statement that Wittgenstein let pass just to obtain a visa, but it seems to me that resorting to such a crass maneuver would be very much out of character for him. Also, in asking Keynes to let Maisky know he was in no way politically dangerous, Wittgenstein's message was clear. Please explain to Maisky that if I am allowed to go to the Soviet Union, the authorities there can rest assured I will never be a troublemaker and will refrain from criticizing their policies or causing problems for them in other ways. But why would Wittgenstein promise such a thing? Remember, this request of his was being made after millions had died from the government-caused famine in Ukraine and other parts of the USSR, when a large number of kulaks were being arrested 
and liquidated, when many people were executed without trial or after kangaroo court proceedings. Why would he want to profess his political innocuousness when approaching a high official of a government with such a monstrous record? Moreover, why would he wish to go to a country where such massive brutalities were being committed by the government on a daily basis, especially if it was not a tourist visit, but a plan to settle there and start a new life? Wittgenstein must have been aware that only a few months before he wrote the letter to Keynes, a huge uproar had erupted in England over large-scale summary executions in the Soviet Union after the Kirov murder. Given Wittgenstein's intense interest in Russia, he probably also knew that when representatives of trade unions and the Labour Party in England publicly protested at the Soviet embassy against these atrocities, it was Maisky, of all people, who defended those killings, arguing that under the circumstances, the Soviet authorities found it imperative to expedite the investigation of the Kirov murder. But if Wittgenstein knew about this episode, and given his interest, it would be strange if the news didn't reach him in one way or another. It seems it did not bother him enough to give him qualms about trying to establish a contact. Speaking of Maisky, I cannot resist making a short digression to report an incident that looks very much like a high-profile tit-for-tat exchange and that has so far escaped the attention of philosophers and others. As noted, in 1935, Maisky was asked by Keynes to do a favor for his philosopher colleague, Wittgenstein. But it appears that in 1944, it was payback time. Now, Keynes was asked by Maisky to do a favor for Maisky's philosopher comrade, Mark Borisovich Mitten. Briefly, Keynes was asked to use his influence to help Mitten publish a paper glorifying the Stalinist philosophy of dialectical materialism in philosophy, one of the leading philosophy journals in England. Keynes complied, and the editor of Philosophy, for reasons unknown, also agreed to cooperate. The reader may remember Mitin as the author of a Pravda article claiming that Soviet biologists were subject to no political pressure, and he made that statement at the very time Lysenko's opponents were being arrested, sent to labor camps, and murdered. Here is how Mitin explained, in 1936, the core of his philosophical method. I was guided in 1931 by a single idea, how better to understand every word and thought of our beloved and wise teacher, Comrade Stalin, and how to apply them to the solution of philosophical problems. No doubt this was the best way to become a Marxist-Leninist in good standing. And indeed, Meaton soon became a top philosopher in the USSR, helped Stalin write sections of a brief history of the all-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks successfully accused other philosophers of sabotage and counter-revolutionary activity, which was of course accompanied by repressive measures against them, became a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and so on. What was Mitin's article in Philosophy about? Titled, 25 Years of Philosophy in the USSR, it claimed, among other things, that philosophy has been raised to an unparalleled level in the Soviet Union, and that many problems in philosophy which are being argued by outstanding philosophers abroad have been solved here on the basis of dialectical materialism. The reader is also informed that, from 1917 to 1938 in the Soviet Union, 327 mailed 200,000 copies of the works of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin have been issued. And yes, there are several paragraphs praising Lysenko's theories as well. To sum up, my hypothesis is that the tit-for-tat exchange of services involving philosophers was conducted in two separate stages. First, Keynes incurred a debt to Maisky via the following causal sequence. Wittgenstein's request, Keynes mediation, Maisky's intervention. Wittgenstein goes to Russia. In the second round, the debt is repaid along the path. Maisky's request, Keynes mediation, editor's decision. Meaden publishes an article in philosophy. Wouldn't it be grotesquely ironic if my guess is correct, and if the price of Wittgenstein's visit to the Soviet Union consisted in a major Western philosophical journal agreeing to publish the Marxist drivel of one of Stalin's henchmen. Needless to say, even knowledgeable philosophers at the time were perfectly aware that dialectical materialism was gibberish. For instance, had the editors of philosophy consulted Isaiah Berlin, indisputably an expert on Marxism and Russian thought, 
there is no way he would have recommended publishing Meaden's piece. This is what he thought about this kind of philosophy. Communists of first-class intellectual ability had nothing to do with Marxist philosophy or dialectical materialism or anything of that kind. Russia? Well, I've read Russian, and I can testify to the fact that nothing poured out except bureaucratic gibberish, absolutely mechanical stuff, which wasn't up to any kind of intellectual standard at all. A. As I think Professor Iyer would corroborate, the formal pronouncements of Soviet philosophers are quite worthless. They do not express anything that their authors may in fact be thinking, but are plainly written for or by them by mechanical expounders of the official doctrine. The Attractions of Stalinism What was Wittgenstein's impression of the Soviet Union? In his well-known biographical sketch, Georg Henrik von Wright, who was Wittgenstein's successor at Cambridge, his friend and one of his literary executors, writes, he visited Moscow and Leningrad in September, 1935, and apparently was pleased with the visit. That Wittgenstein's reaction to what he saw was not unfavorable is confirmed by the fact that two years later, he considered going to Russia again. Ray Monk has a puzzling view of Wittgenstein's relation to the Soviet Union. Monk first says, even after the show trials of 1936, the worsening of relations between Russia and the West and the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939, Wittgenstein continued to express his sympathy with the Soviet regime, so much so that he was taken by some of his students at Cambridge to be a Stalinist, and then continues. This label is, of course, nonsense. But why would it be nonsense? Monk does not say. In fact, the opposite seems to be true. It is disputing the label Stalinist that is nonsensical under the circumstances. Remaining sympathetic to the Soviet regime after the show trials of 1936 and the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939 implies in the absence of countervailing evidence being a Stalinist. And Monk does not provide any countervailing evidence. According to A.C. Jackson for an Australian philosopher and Wittgenstein's former student and follower, Wittgenstein was regarded as a Stalinist by those who knew him well. In a later conversation, Jackson went further and assured his interviewer that Wittgenstein's politics were ultra-left wing and he had strong sympathy for Stalin and the Soviet Union. Interestingly, when Elizabeth Anscum, one of Wittgenstein's most trusted friends and collaborators, was directly asked whether those in his close circle saw him as a Stalinist, she actually did not deny it at all, but resorted to equivocation. This is telling because as one of Wittgenstein's greatest admirers and defenders of his legacy, in all likelihood, she would have reacted vigorously had she thought the label was nonsense. Therefore, the best comment on Anscombe's reply is to say, the lady doth protest too little, methinks. It is worth stressing that many of Wittgenstein's friends were communists or fellow travelers, so it would not be surprising if some of them had infected him with the Stalinist bug. Take Piero Sraffa, an Italian economist. Wittgenstein met with once a week for discussion over several years during the time they were both at Cambridge. Wittgenstein acknowledged his indebtedness to Sraffa in the preface to Philosophical Investigations, stating that Sraffa gave a stimulus for the most consequential ideas of that book. Sraffa visited the Soviet Union a few years before Wittgenstein and came back enthusiastic and very confident about the future of the Soviet system. Might this enthusiasm have rubbed off on Wittgenstein? After all, Sraffa had a huge influence on him. Wittgenstein once said that his discussions with Sraffa made him feel like a tree from which all branches had been cut. It speaks volumes about Sraffa's political views that, according to former president of Italy and former communist Giorgio Napolitano, Sraffa maintained regular contacts with the Italian Communist Party. Whenever he came to Rome, he never missed meeting with Togliatti and other communist leaders. As we know now, on the basis of documents from Russian archives that became accessible after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Palmiro Togliatti was a hardline Stalinist. For example, he secretly asked the authorities in Moscow whether the Italian Communist Party should plan for an armed resurrection in case the Popular Front won the election in 1948 and their victory were challenged by reactionaries. Also, 
he sided with Stalinists after Khrushchev's 1956 speech in which the cult of Stalin was denounced and advocated Soviet intervention in Hungary even before the Kremlin had made the decision about it. When his Italian comrades deviated from the party line in private conversations with him, Togliatti reported them to the Russian ambassador. The fact that Srafa kept such close contacts with the Italian Communist Party, which received more Soviet financing and for a longer time than any other European or American Communist Party in the 20th century, and that he regularly met its leaders who had such impeccable Stalinist credentials, certainly tells us something about the man himself and the extent of his leftist loyalties. And yet this was the person whose opinion Wittgenstein valued above all others on questions of politics, and who informed Wittgenstein about current affairs, because Wittgenstein disliked reading newspapers. Let us look at some reminiscences from people who knew Wittgenstein. It should be stressed that these were all his personal friends, so any bias would be expected to be in his favor. The atmosphere of Stalinism contained something that attracted him. A total destruction of early 20th century social forms was required, he thought, if there was to be any improvement. Die Leidenschaft for Spricht etwas, he said to Austrian philosopher Friedrich Weismann, the passion that infused society there meant that some good could come from it. Fania Pascal had the impression that the sufferings of so many in the Russia of the 1920s and 1930s were accepted by Wittgenstein as an accompaniment, relatively unimportant, of the affirmation of a new society. Misery there would have been anyway. Now at least it was for a purpose. These attitudes did not dispose him to think well of the British government or of its attitude towards the European situation. He looked at a picture of them, a lot of wealthy old men, and contrasted them, God forgive him, with Stalin. On political questions, from 1939 onwards anyway, Wittgenstein was generally sympathetic with the Russian communists. I loathed Stalinism from 1937 onwards, or earlier, and I used to disagree with Wittgenstein's judgments on Russia on this account. If you spoke of regimentation of Russian workers, of workers not being free to leave or change their jobs, or perhaps of labor camps, Wittgenstein was not impressed. It would be terrible if the mass of the people there, or in any society, had no regular work. He also thought it would be terrible if the society were ridden by class distinctions, although he said less about this. On the other hand, tyranny, with a questioning gesture, shrugging his shoulders, doesn't make me feel indignant. If the existence of labor camps did not impress Wittgenstein, nor did tyranny make him indignant, he probably did not share that high regard for human liberty that usually makes people outraged at totalitarian oppression. Likewise, if the sufferings of so many are regarded as just an accompaniment and relatively unimportant at that, then it becomes easier to justify rougher methods of building a new society. And it appears that this is precisely what Wittgenstein did. His friend Maurice Drury says Wittgenstein once told him, People have accused Stalin of having betrayed the Russian Revolution, but they have no idea about the problems that Stalin had to deal with and the dangers he saw threatening Russia. Two comments should suffice. First, Wittgenstein's excuse is exactly how Stalinists themselves typically tried to justify Stalin's actions when it was no longer possible to deny the grim truth. And second, it is ludicrous to suggest that it was necessary to kill millions and send millions of others to the gulag in order to achieve any legitimate political goal. Here is another recollection of Wittgenstein from his student Theodore Redpath. One evening I saw an English film in which Ralph Richardson took the part of a landowner who seemed to me a thoroughly decent sort of chap, but who was morally condemned by the film, apparently simply for being a landowner. This struck me as grossly unfair, and not long afterwards I happened to tell Wittgenstein what I thought. His reply struck me, as so much of what he said used to do. He said that simply being a landowner could have been quite bad enough. Now, if one believes that merely being a landowner can be quite bad enough, hasn't one thereby made a giant step toward condemning kulaks? And isn't one then already on the path of finding at least some justification for Stalin's policy of dekulakization 
liquidation of kulaks as a class. Philosophical genius opposes the war against Hitler. In an article in the New York Review of Books, the physicist Freeman Dyson writes that Wittgenstein returned to Cambridge in 1946 after six years of duty at the hospital, 2012. Dyson is wrong. Wittgenstein did indeed volunteer to work at Guy's Hospital in London, his contribution to the war effort against the Nazis, but his service was considerably shorter than six years. And his non-involvement with the war for a couple of years is crucial for inferring his political views. The distinguished English philosopher and one of Wittgenstein's literary executors, Anthony Kenny, gets temporal facts wrong too. In 1939, Wittgenstein was appointed Professor of Philosophy at Cambridge in succession to G. E. Moore, but before he could take up his chair, war broke out. He served as a medical orderly during the war. In fact, it was more than two years after the war broke out that Wittgenstein applied for a leave of absence from Cambridge, informing the Vice-Chancellor that he decided to take on some war work at Guy's Hospital. In fact, Wittgenstein's attitude toward the war changed sometime during the summer of 1941. We know this because in November 1940, he signed a letter in support of the so-called People's Convention, an anti-war event organized by the Communist Party of Great Britain that was about to take place in London on January 12, 1941. The People's Convention was a result of the Nazi-Soviet Pact in 1939 which forced the British communists to make a volte face overnight. They switched from all-out support for the war against Hitler to a strident condemnation of both sides, the Nazis and the Allies, for waging an unjust imperialist war. In that spirit, they organized the People's Convention to gain wider support for their freshly adopted appeasement stance. Douglas Hyde, a former British communist who had served as a member of the Central Committee of the party, described later how at the beginning of the war, the leadership was given new instructions from the Comintern. The Central Committee was in the middle of a meeting, preparing a passionate manifesto in support of the anti-fascist war, when the message from Moscow arrived. Then, unexpectedly, in walked the British representative to the Communist International, whom everyone had thought was still in Moscow. He took one look at the manifesto, and told the leaders they would have to scrap it. It was, he said, an imperialist war. The Comintern had said so, and that meant opposing it in the classical Marxist way. After a short discussion, as expected, the leadership made a U-turn and issued a manifesto that now condemned the war against Hitler as imperialist and unjust. This war is a fight between imperialist powers over profits, colonies, and world domination. The leaders of the Labour Party and trades union movement have sided fully with the government of Chamberlain and Churchill and are attempting to get the working class movement to support their imperialist war aims. This policy, if not challenged, will hand over enormous numbers of young people to become cannon fodder in an unjust war. Although the People's Convention was organized by communists, they used it to attract much broader based opposition to Churchill's government including many of those who did not support the official party line about the imperialist war. For this reason, the anti-war tenor could not be as openly expressed as in the party's documents. Nevertheless, some of the six main points of the People's Convention, a complaint about low living standards, a request for bomb-proof shelters, and a plea for people's peace, have widely been seen as undermining the nation's morale and encouraging defeatism. And this was all happening at a critical historical moment when the British were in a desperate fight for survival with very uncertain prospects. Needless to say, the six main points made no mention of Hitler, or God forbid, the war against Hitler. One of the remaining main points added an air of absurdity to the People's Convention. Friendship with the Soviet Union. Why on earth would a country that was in the midst of a mortal battle against Hitler single out for special friendship the country that had just recently signed a pact with him. If there remains any doubt about how much the Communist Party was involved in the People's Convention, here is Douglas Hyde again, with the insider's perspective. It was not surprising that Dunkirk, when it came, troubled us not at all, 
and served only to make what we regarded as being the almost inevitable defeat of Britain appear as a magnificent opportunity. Taking this to heart, we administered all the blows we could through the tactics of the People's Convention, through trying to create war wariness, through industrial disputes, through the spread of disaffection among the members of the armed forces, and through exploiting every possible grievance, political, social, economic, or industrial, upon which we could seize. Whilst the party had perforce publicly to pretend that it had no intention of sabotaging the war effort or of turning the war into civil war, our members could at the same time be discussing in their classes every conceivable detail of how best to achieve the defeat of one's own government in war. Of course, everything changed on June 22, 1941. After Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union, the communists radically changed their minds about the war, as did Wittgenstein. The enormous sophistication and hypercritical spirit that Wittgenstein displayed in his philosophical work disappeared when his thoughts turned to politics. In that context, to use his famous simile, he was like a fly that could not find a way out of the fly bottle. In a letter to Norman Malcolm in 1944, Wittgenstein lamented that the clear thinking nurtured in philosophy is often abandoned when philosophers address practical issues of great importance. What is the use of studying philosophy if all that it does for you is to enable you to talk with some plausibility about some abstruse questions of logic, etc., and if it does not improve your thinking about the important questions of everyday life? Wittgenstein was obviously unaware that his lament about the uselessness of philosophy for everyday thinking also applied to his own case, and with a vengeance.